Okay, good afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to give a background on myogenesis, how you make muscle, how you repair muscle, just to give you a background to what the changes occurring in FSHD and some of the things that then people are going to try and approach by using their therapeutic interventions. So basically, there's lots of muscle throughout your body. The body of an average guy can have 38% 38 of your body weight is muscle. There's 639 muscles spread throughout the body. So it's a lot of it. It's a big tissue. And obviously, it's important for movement. For... So if you kind of think about your forearm, you have a muscle that contracts that brings your forearm up. But that's then pulled another muscle into position. So that muscle can then contract to bring your arm back down. So all your muscles are arranged, so you're only going to generate force by the muscles getting shorter. Um, as we've already said before, you have lots of different tissues in your body, liver, brain, muscle. And so the genes that are expressed in a particular tissue make a set of proteins, and that proteins make the cells have the characteristics. So muscle, obviously, has lots of muscle cells in it. So these are cells that are expressing muscle genes that give them the function. So the way muscle is made, you have muscle stem cells. So remember, we had the cells earlier, so a nucleus sitting in the middle of a cell. Muscle is slightly unusual in that what happens is you have lots of cells that fuse together. When they fuse together, they make a muscle fiber. So in this example here, you have a muscle stem cell. It joins together with another muscle stem cell and then another one, and you get three of them, for example, and they make a small muscle fiber. And as they fuse together, they donate their nucleus. So they share their cytoplasm, but they donate their nucleus. So a muscle fiber essentially is one very, very big cell that has hundreds of myonuclei, hundreds of nuclei, controlling this one cell because it's so big. So that's slightly unusual from what we see with other types of cell. So this is just how a muscle set up. You have a, normally you have a bone, you have a tendon that's inelastic, you have a muscle. The muscle gets shorter, it pulls on the tendon, the tendon pulls the bone, and you then articulate around a joint. So that's how the muscle's working in the sort of normal situation. And then the muscle is made up of hundreds, thousands of muscle fibers. So this is just a image of what the muscle fiber looks like. And these muscle fibers are packed full of sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are just the protein arrangements that generate the force. If you think about interlocking fingers, they just slide past each other. And in sliding past each other, they pull on whatever they're attached to. The muscle gets shorter. You generate force, and that's the movement. So in this particular image here, you've got some muscle fiber. If you look along a muscle fiber, the one on your left, um, you can just see basically it's a long tube. You have blue dots at the end. Those are the nuclei that control the whole tube. And that tube is full of these sarcomeres that are going to generate force. On the other side is looking along the muscle fibers. If you think about a muscle fiber as a tube, the one on the left is looking along the tube. The one on the right is cutting across, so all the tubes are coming out of the screen towards you. So you can see muscle fibers, the pink, with the blue dots on the edge, and those are the myonuclei, the nuclei that control those cells. So this is a healthy piece of human muscle, and the things to notice are the fibers are regular in size. You've got blue dots on the edge of the muscle fibers, so those are the nuclei. You then have... The muscle fibers packed quite closely together. There's not a lot of tissue between the muscle fibers. And then in between these kind of fascicles, these collection of muscle fibers, you have connective tissue where blood vessels run, nerves run, etc. Um, so you have a population of stem cells in your muscles that are there to maintain the muscle to repair the muscle. So when you're born, you get bigger, you get bigger, the satellite cells contribute new nuclei to the muscle fibers, so the muscle fiber can grow and grow and grow. So as you want the muscle fiber to grow, you need more nuclei. So the satellite cells, these stem cells, are going to make the muscle grow, they're going to look after the muscle, and they're also going to repair the muscle. So in this situation here, this is a piece of normal looking muscle. That muscle gets damaged. You see the muscle break down. You then start to see the satellite cells activate. They repair the muscle so that you can then get a muscle that has been repaired. So this is a situation that happens on an insult to a muscle. I was a lot younger then. <laughs> but the other thing is that muscle can still respond to need. So that if you're adult, you're fully grown. If you start working out, your muscle responds by getting bigger. So the muscle fibers themselves get bigger, 
and those muscle fibers have more nuclei contributed to them from the stem cells. So a therapy idea would be to use things that can make your muscle bigger. The fibers that you have make them bigger and stronger. So the muscular dystrophies, essentially as a group of diseases, it just means muscle weakness, muscle wasting. And this is an example of a disease called Duchenne. But why I highlight this is because Duchenne is known to have a regenerative response. So people have Duchenne, the muscle starts to get damaged, but then satellite cells activate and they repair the muscle. So these, if you see in this particular image here, on the right, you can see those brown dots. Those are immature muscle fibers that are repairing. They're being made to replace the lost fibers. So in FSHD, these are just some images of muscle fibers in FSHD. And from the um, pathologist, there's a cl some classic things that happen in FSHD. So the muscle fibers are different in size. You have inflammation occurring. Um, and you can see these images. And also, you can see areas where you have regeneration occurring. So in this particular image here, you can see that you have the signs of muscle fibers, big pink muscle fibers, nuclei on the edge. But in amongst there, I've just circled a few here, these fibers are fibers that are repairing, basophilic fibers. So the muscle is responding to the damage being caused by Dux4 by FSHD by trying to make new fibers to repair, replace those fibers. This is just a higher power image again of these fibers that are repairing. So then, as a disease progresses, for some reason on the right here, that muscle looks relatively okay. On the left, that muscle looks quite degenerated. So as the disease is progressing, you're losing muscle fibers, the functional muscle fibers you need to generate power, and you're getting it replaced by scar tissue, inflammation, etc. So that's the situation that eventually happens. Um, so what lots of people are doing is trying to work out two things. A, can they make those existing muscle fibers bigger and stronger? And B, the kind of thing that we're interested in is, can you augment that endogenous repair? We know repair happens in muscle, but for some reason it's then going to fail eventually in FSHD because you're going to have this damage, you're going to lose the muscle power. So why are the satellite cells, the stem cells, still not maintaining and repairing that muscle? So that's kind of what the, some of the background to what other people are going to be talking about. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Ken Addy from Acceleron, who will be talking about myostatin inhib inhibition. Hi, all, and thanks for um, the invitation to speak with you. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about uh, the, the preliminary results from a phase two trial of a novel therapeutic in patients with FSHD. That's a sentence you don't hear at this meeting too often, but hopefully that's going to change. Um, I work for a company called Acceleron Pharma. We've been around for almost 15 years. All of our drugs are in the same protein family called TGF-beta, and myostatin is one of the members of this family. Uh, the name implies it's something that prevents muscle from growing. It's a naturally occurring protein, myostatin, um, also known as GDF-8. And so why does the body have something that prevents muscle from growing? And that's basically something that's true in all systems in, in the body. We have stimulators, we have inhibitors. This happens to be an inhibitor. Uh, we like to refer to our products that we're developing now as myostatin plus inhibitors because it's not just myostatin. There are other members of this family of proteins that can inhibit muscle, including activins and other GDFs. Um, so, you know, myostatin was discovered 20 years ago, and, and, and now finally we're figuring out ways to to try and utilize uh, blocking the inhibitor in order to stimulate muscle growth. So we currently have, um, we've been working in the neuromuscular field for about 10 years. We've done studies with myostatin inhibitors in Duchenne. Uh, we've thought about um, other diseases, FSHD, as long ago as 10 years ago. But now with these newer uh, molecules that we've developed, these are our sort of second generation molecules, uh, we're now actually embarking, and FSHD was selected by us as the first um, muscular dystrophy to, to look into. We also have a study now in Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, we have two dis uh, drugs in development right now, ACE2494 on the left, is a systemic therapy, so it's one that you, we give uh, by subcutaneous injection. It goes into the bloodstream and can affect the entire body. Uh, there are other companies, Pfizer, Novartis, Roche, others who have systemic myostatin inhibitors in development for other diseases. Uh, right now we're in healthy volunteers in the phase one trial. 
But I'm going to speak to you today about ACE83. That's our locally acting muscle um, drug. And as I mentioned, it's in phase two trials now. We've completed our phase one trial in healthy volunteers. It's in the June issue of Muscle and Nerve, uh, written up. And, uh, and now we're in phase two trials, which means we're doing patient studies in FSHD and CMT. So you may ask, why would we bother to make a drug that only acts locally uh, in one or two muscles where, that we are injecting into instead of the systemic one. And so the answer, there's three answers really. One is that um, it acts locally and when it gets out from the muscle into the bloodstream, it's broken down rapidly. So we have no systemic effects, but we have no systemic side effects. So we're making a drug that could be, have a very nice safety profile with very few adverse events, right? Secondly is sometimes we just want to treat certain muscles. And so diseases where there's focal involvement, that means specific muscles are involved at different times, maybe asymmetrically, um, maybe we want to target individual muscles. Um, but the third reason is the most important reason, and that is that these um, hormones, if you will, are, don't only act in an endocrine way and travel in the bloodstream to go from one place to another. Myostatin is actually made locally in the muscle. It's what we call an autocrine factor. It's, it's made in the muscle and then it acts on the muscle. And so there's a lot more myostatin in the muscle than what we're able to um, neutralize in the bloodstream. So when we give a high, you know, higher concentration of drug into the muscle, I'm going to show you results that, that we're seeing about three times as much muscle growth as uh, any systemic uh, agent has been able to do. And I've done studies for many years with growth hormones and, and uh, other agents uh, that um, it's, it's a similar issue. Um, myostatin seems to be uh, the most potent way to build muscle and we're finding that the local administration is also quite potent. So we selected, as I showed on the last slide, a couple of muscles in particular that we're interested in. Um, we, this is based on what Dr. Statlin was uh, discussing earlier, uh, a survey of all of you in the FSH Society that we undertook to, to find out which muscles are important to you in daily life. Uh, we've talked to patient focus groups like we did today. Um, and we found that you know, there are muscles that we can treat uh, in the upper arm or the lower leg that will address foot drop, for example, um, and, and re reduce the risk of falls, hopefully, and of course help you to bring your arm to your body and, and a lot of activities that involve um, bicep strength. That's not to say we won't go into other muscles in the future, but these were uh, proof of concept, if you will, muscles that we are targeting initially. And I won't go into too much detail on how this works, but the idea is uh, if the drug can find the myostatin and, and bind to it, then the myostatin can't bind to the muscle cell and, and inhibit the muscle growth. And we're, make, we're taking advantage of a naturally occurring inhibitor of the inhibitor, and it's called folistatin. And folistatin uh, you know, has been thought about because it's one of the most potent ways to do this, um, but it's very hard to make it uh, last in the body for a long enough time to work, but we found a way to make it sticky and stay in the muscle. And as I mentioned, also it uh, breaks down as soon as it goes into the circulation. So we have this potent inhibitor of myostatin in the muscle that we inject into and, and that has uh, hopefully very few um, systemic effects and adverse events. Uh, so this is our trial, it's ongoing in the US as well as Canada and Spain. We've completed part one and we've started part two. Part one is on the left uh, where we do a dose escalation. We try different dose levels um, in groups of patients, either in the TA muscle, that's the one in the lower leg for foot drop, and the biceps in another group of patients. You can see the eligibility criteria and our objectives of course are safety, tolerability, and then muscle growth. Um, and function. And I'm going to share with you some of the MRI results that you also heard described recently uh, with those voxels. And we've counted all the voxels and I'll show you the results for the first two cohorts. Um, and cohorts were the 150 and 200 milligrams. And I just want to show you on the right side of the slide that um, we're now in part two. That means it's going to be placebo controlled. So half the patients get placebo, half get the active drug for six months. And then in the second six months, everyone's going to get the active drug. First, uh, review of the safety for these uh, initial um, 24 patients. Um, well tolerated, there were some discomfort and other injection site reactions at the point where the 
where the drug is being administered. Uh, but otherwise, we saw very little in the in ways of other adverse events uh, beyond the, the muscle that was being injected. Uh, we looked at uh, laboratory results, and they were also, um, we didn't see any abnormalities uh, of note. <coughs> What about efficacy? So now we take those MRI scans that we do at the beginning and we repeat them during the study. The MRI results I'm showing here are from day 106. So we inject uh, the, the patients uh, five times every three weeks. And so the last injection was day 85. So this is three weeks after that last injection. We do another MRI and we measure the muscle volume. So you're seeing here the total muscle volume. We scan the entire muscle, whether it's the TA or the biceps. And you can see here that the muscle biome uh, didn't change appreciably. If you look at the tibialis anterior in the untreated side, we only treated one side. But in the side that did get the drug, you see an 8% increase uh, from baseline at the lower dose and a 16 or 17% increase uh, at the higher dose. And in the biceps, we also saw about 18%. So let's think back to what I told you earlier. We sort of hit a, a threshold, a, a, a max with systemic therapies around 5% with these other drugs, including our own uh, systemic that we've used in the past. So in that 5 to 7, you know, 3 to 7% range, um, but around 5%, here we're seeing um, over 15%. And there's another bullet up there that we saw a decrease in fat fraction. So when we look at those voxels, we measure the percentage of fat in each of the uh, in, uh, muscle areas that we look at, intramuscular fat. And that's actually being shown to decrease um, by about 5% on the tibialis anterior patients. So this is telling us that we're adding lean muscle um, and increasing the size of good contractile muscle fibers uh, with this treatment. Now we have a lot more endpoints um, that we're going to share later this year, hopefully, or next year uh, when we uh, complete the analysis uh, of these data. But this is the uh, MRI results for now. Um, it's a multi-center trial. Now it's a multinational trial. These are the centers in the U.S. who are currently recruiting patients. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Wubles from Strykogen. So uh, I'm going to tell you about a treatment that I've developed at UNR, and I also work at Strikagid part of the time. And it actually enhances muscle regeneration in several muscular dystrophies, but we're also looking at it in conjunction with FSHD. Uh, so it was originally found in a screen for alpha-7 integrin enhancers. Um, and when we actually used it in a mouse model for Duchenne's, we found that we had increased the level of regeneration in muscle by quite a bit. And this led to us thinking about its use in other muscular dystrophies. And so you can see how that might be effective in FSHD. Um, it's also FDA approved. And so this drug could be fast tracked uh, and potentially be in the clinic rapidly. And so uh, on this slide, we're actually seeing um, in the first panel on the left, um, some treatments that were actually done in the MDX mouse model for Duchenne's. And we're actually increasing the level of PAX7 cells per millimeter squared, um, which is exciting because that means you have more satellite cells, more muscle regeneration. And we're actually creating more niches um, with the drug, uh, with the treatment. It's, it's pretty exciting. And on the right, we're just showing that the drug is actually affecting the protein that we originally set out to increase. Um, so we've set out to do two different studies, one a short-term study and one a long-term study. Um, this study has been s funded by the FSH Society. We're using a mouse model, much like Scott's, that uh, was created by Dr. Peter Jones. It's called the FlexD um, FSHD mouse model. In the short-term study, we're beginning treatment with Strika001 at seven weeks of age. We're inducing the DUX4 expression in the muscle with tamoxifen at eight weeks. And then we're looking at physiological characteristics um, and other assessments at 11 weeks, three weeks later. Uh, the chronic uh, mouse model that we're using is, starts at a similar time point, but we're doing multiple rounds of tamoxifen injection in order to induce 
the Ducks 4 expression. Uh, this should mimic the plateau and cliff effects, hopefully in the muscle that I know I've experienced and I, I know many other uh, FSHD uh, patients have uh, experienced. Um, so all of this data is very preliminary. We've, we only started in February. And so unfortunately, uh, our statistical power isn't there yet. And uh, I'll be excited to, to share it in a couple of years after we uh, get our mouse numbers up. But I'll share what we've gotten so far. Uh, so in this panel, we see on the, on the left, we see that uh, we aren't, aren't affecting uh, ducks for expression in any way. In fact, the muscle um, in some ways looks like it has more ducks uh, activity going on. And we're not affecting the initial uh, response to the ducks for it's actually damaging the muscle just as much as we predicted it would. We're, we're looking at enhancement after that damage occurs. Um, in C, you can see that uh, we've dropped the fibrosis a little bit, but the, again, the mouse numbers are too small to really stay, say anything statistically relevant. Um, most importantly for what I'm looking for is we saw a 25 to 30% improvement at 11 weeks of age in the muscle force output when we looked and took a, a mouse muscle, hung it, and looked at very small levels of uh, force that were able to be generated. This is pretty exciting because it means that we haven't regenerated quite a bit more muscle um, after losing about the same amount. Um, so we can see that same effect in the twitch and the tetanus, which is just a very small muscle movement compared to trying to uh, reach as hard as you can with tetanus. Uh, this effect is being uh, uh, established by increased regeneration, so we wanted to look in these mice and see if we, we had caused more regeneration to occur. And that, the best way to do that is actually by embryonic mice and heavy chain. Uh, which is shown in, in green in these uh, histology figures, in immunofluorescence, we get about 10% more uh, embryonic mice and heavy chain staining, uh, which is indicative of about 10% more fibers that have either been maintained and regenerated or been formed by the drug. You can imagine what 10% more fibers would do to anybody's muscle. Um, and so in the chronic study, uh, we've gotten through about two months worth of uh, treatments on the first set of mice. We actually have a large cohort of mice actually going through now. Uh, we've looked at both weight and grip strength uh, thus far, and these mice are still alive and being treated as we speak. So in the um, both males and females, we actually, with the FlexD mouse model, see a more severe effect of the ducts 4 in females than in males. Um, but both, you can, both of the tamoxifen in, in induced lines actually lose weight pretty rapidly compared to the non-tamoxifen treated controls. But with Strika 001 treatment, we actually see in both cases that we're recovering the weight better or we're losing slightly less weight, which is indicative of uh, the increased muscle mass that's actually being um, created in these, in these animals with our treatment. Uh, further, you can see that that, trans that increased muscle mass actually translates directly into a, a statistically uh, improved grip strength at this time. So it's early, and we got a lot, of, we got a long way to go. But uh, the early conclusions are that Strike 001 appears like it can be used as a standalone therapeutic for FSHD patient use. Um, we hope to begin clinical trial planning within 12 months to maybe a year and a half. And uh, what's really exciting is to start thinking about how this could be used to treat patients in conjunction with some of the other uh, small molecule treatments or myostatin inhibitors, some of the other treatments that are coming online um, because we think we can have a, a bigger effect if we stop the ducts for activity and we're causing the massive amount of muscle regeneration that we see with our small molecule tre treatment. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone that's worked on this from UNR, uh, Strikogen, and funding from the FSH Society. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Chad Heatwall. 
uh, and he will be speaking on HGH and testosterone trial. Thank you very much. It really is a pleasure to be here with you. I'd just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, talk at this meeting. So uh, as you said, I'm Chad Heatwam from the University of Rochester, and I'll be talking about the STARFISH uh, study, and this stands for Study of Testosterone in Recombinant HGH and FSHD Muscular Dystrophy. And this is a um, investigator-initiated, single-site, open-label, NIH-sponsored safety and tolerability generic trial uh, for a therapy for FSH. So again, that's a little bit of a mouthful. And uh, this study was really based on um, data and studies that were done in other populations, and specifically um, three very large studies that were conducted in healthy elderly men. And they gave these two therapies in combination. And what they found is that um, this is one of the rare uh, therapeutic approaches that not only increases muscle mass, but potentially also increases uh, function and strength. And so in these three studies, they went about it and looked at it in a couple different ways. But uh, the increase in lean muscle mass was about 10 pounds in, in one of these studies. The increase in strength uh, ranged up to 29% in a collective composite strength measure. Uh, there was increases in aerobic activity, and that was uh, tested with cycle and treadmill testing. And in all three studies, there was a reasonable um, safety and tolerability pattern to the, the therapeutics. And so the key point is that the utility and safety of combination therapy of these two agents has really never been tested in muscular dystrophy population. And so a couple years ago, I decided, well, it's about time that we uh, take a look at this. And so here's a diagram of, of the potential benefits of combination therapy. And as you see uh, on the left is uh, RGH, which is recombinant HGH and testosterone. And there's some um, data to suggest that um, these two agents may be synergistic in their effect and that the um, effect of them is greater than either of the agents alone um, added together. And so, as I just mentioned, um, in healthy adult males, there is increased strength, increased muscle mass, and increased aerobic capacity. And so, obviously, you know, it's of great interest in FSHD patients uh, who have muscle atrophy, who have uh, reduced muscle function, uh, reduced strength, uh, potentially uh, great patient reported um, disease burden and prolonged um, walking times, it may be of benefit to this population as well, but we don't know. And so um, the aims of this study were really threefold. And um, the first was really to examine the safety and tolerability of this agent. Can patients actually administer this agent? And if so, is it safe to do so? Um, the study itself is a 36-week study. Uh, all participants receive uh, the uh, study medication, so there's no placebo arm, and they all receive it for about a 24-week uh, period with a 12-week washout period where they're off medicine but watch carefully. Uh, the second aim was really to measure the effect of combination therapy on biomarkers, uh, including lean uh, body mass measured by DEXA and serum markers, including total testosterone, free testosterone, and IGF level. And the third thing, although this is not an efficacy tri trial, um, we did look at some measures of efficacy, including uh, six-minute walk time, ambulation, strength, functional measures, breathing function, and patient reported uh, disease burden. And so the inclusion criteria, um, it, this study is only for men and, and only because the first studies were for men. There is data for women that this could potentially be a effective therapy as well. However, the dose of the medications for that population are not as well. So we wanted to first test in, in uh, men only and if effective, then go back and look and see if we could do a similar study with women. Um, all patients have FSHD, um, hematocrit less than 50, which most people do. Um, patients had to have good prostate uh, health they had to have no diabetes or insulin uh, insensitivity. They had to be able to walk continuously for six minutes. 
they had to be able to give the medicine. So the HGH is a daily medicine that's given subcutaneously um, at different sites, and the uh, uh, testosterone is a medicine that's given every two weeks and uh, exclusion criteria is, is listed. And it, I will just step aside and just say, if you're interested in this study, um, all of this data is uh, available on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, which I would encourage you to go on there to look at not only this study, but all the other promising studies that are being do done in FSHD. And so if you go to that and you say FSHD and put starfish, um, our study will come up. And so here's um, just a, a table of the different types of outcomes. Um, we have extensive safety monitoring. We have a cardiologist. We have two endocrinologists. We have a urologist. Uh, we have three uh, co-investigators in addition to myself. And so uh, patients are evaluated at baseline, and then at eight weeks, and then 16 weeks, and then 24 weeks, and then 36 weeks. And they get weekly calls by our clinical coordinator is absolutely great. and uh, as you kind of heard, we, we uh, like to test our patients when they come in to visit us. Um, we do pay for the travel expenses, and uh, we test their muscle strength and their function, and we do blood work. Uh, there is no biopsies, but we do do DEXA scans to look at their muscle mass. And so the progress to date, um, this is a very small study, uh, 20 patients. Uh, again, everyone receives a uh, study, uh, study drug. Um, to date, six uh, participants have been enrolled. We're ahead of schedule. Uh, three additional uh, participants are scheduled to, to be visit. Uh, there's been 10 uh, study visits completed. Um, and to date, no patient has dropped out of the study. And um, so we have 11 additional spots. Uh, I have a, a list of 27 uh, patients who I'll be reviewing in the next week uh, to identify our last 11. And so our full results are expected. Uh, in 2022. Um, just want to thank you uh, for listening and also like to thank our team at the University of Rochester that uh, does this study. Uh, Liz Luby is our clinical coordinator. Um, if you're interested in being considered for the study, um, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and her number is also, I can give it to you if you're interested, is 585-275-7867. Uh, Two seven five seven eight six seven, and uh, she asked that I didn't give uh, out her uh, mobile phone, so um, you'll just have to leave a, a message. And uh, just want to thank the rest of our team at the University of Rochester. Thanks.